Assalamu alaikum. Thank you all for joining us for our sixth educational webinar in our educational series. This webinar is titled Gaza, the Soul of Palestine. AMP chose this title because Gaza is not just a small strip of territory. Gaza is the foundation of the Palestinian liberation movement. It represents the essence of Palestine and represents the cultural and political consciousness of the Palestinian people. While Gaza as a territory is small in size, it is the embodiment of all Palestinians. So while Jerusalem is the heart of Palestine, Gaza is indeed its soul. But Gaza is suffering. It's nearly two million people, approximately three fourths of which are refugees, are denied their right to return to their homes, are living under a military occupation imposed since 1967, and dispossession and ethnic cleansing from their homelands that began in 1947, 1948. For more than 13 years since 2007, Israel has maintained a brutal land, sea, and air blockade over Gaza, essentially imposing collective punishment over its people. This has caused the humanitarian crisis that has crumbled the healthcare system, infrastructure, economy, educational system, and so on. In a few days, on the 27th of December, we'll be marking the 12th anniversary of Operation Cast Lead. This brutal operation uh, by Israel caused over 1,400 deaths, and this was not this was one of many um, Israeli operations against Gaza. And it must be noted, it must be emphasized that Gaza is under daily collective punishment. So these operations are are grander in scale, but Gaza on a daily basis um, incurs violence, incurs punishment, restrictions, and so on. The United Nations have, has reported for the past few years that by 2020, this year that we are in, only eight days left, Gaza will become, quote, uninhabitable. Other sources say it will become unlivable. Yet the Palestinians remain vigilant, they remain steadfast, and committed to their liberation struggle. For more insight, context, and clarity, we welcome our esteemed panel. My name is Tariq Khalil. I am the education coordinator for the American Muslims for Palestine. I'll be moderating this session. And we have with us three powerhouse speakers. We have Leila Haddad, who is a Palestinian American journalist, author, and analyst. Her books include her memoir, Gaza Mom, Palestine Politics, Parenting, and Everything in Between, and The Gaza Kitchen, A Palestinian Culinary Journey. She frequently speaks about the intersection of identity, food, and politics. Through her work as a writer, culinary ethnographer, and documentarian, she provides much needed insight into the human experience of the region. In 2014, she was featured on CNN with Anthony Bourdain as his guide in the Gaza Strip. Originally from Gaza, she lives in Clarksville, Maryland with her husband and their four children. We also have with us Dr. Ramzi Baroud, who is a US-based Palestinian journalist, media consultant, author, internationally syndicated columnist and editor of the Palestine Chronicle. He is a former managing editor of the London-based Middle East Eye and former deputy managing editor of Al Jazeera Online. He taught mass communication at Australia's Curtin University of Technology, Malaysia campus. He is the author of four books and a contributor to many others. His books include These Chains Will Be Broken, Palestinian Stories of Struggles and Defiance in Israeli Prisons, The Last Earth, A Palestinian Story, My Father Was a Freedom Fighter, Gaza's Untold Story, and The Second Palestinian Intifada, A Chronicle of a People's Struggle. His books were translated to several languages, including French, Turkish, Arabic, Korean, Malayam, and among others. Baroud has a doctorate of philosophy in Palestine studies from the European Center for Palestinian Studies at the University of Exeter, and was a non-resident scholar at Orphalia Center for Global and International Studies, University of California, Santa Barbara. He is currently a non-resident scholar at Istanbul Zayam University Center for Islam and Global Affairs. And last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Hatem Bazian, who is a co-founder and professor of Islamic law and theology at Zaytuna College, 
the first accredited Muslim liberal arts college in the United States. In addition to that, Professor Bazian is a lecturer in the departments of Near Eastern and Asian American and Asian Diaspora Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. Between 2002 and 2007, he served as an adjunct professor of law at Boalt Hall School of Law at the University of California, Berkeley. He teaches courses on Islamic law and society, Islam in America, communities and institutions, deconstructing Islamophobia and othering of Islam, religious studies and Middle Eastern studies. In addition to Berkeley, Professor Bazian served as a visiting professor in religious studies at St. Mary's College of California from 2001 to 2007 and advisor to the Religion, Politics and Globalization Center at UC Berkeley. He is also founder and national chair of American Muslims for Palestine, board member of the Islamic Scholarship Fund, Muslim Legal Fund of America and chair of Northern California Islamic Council. There's much more I can say about all of our esteemed speakers, but we need to make some time to discuss the, sub the substance of this webinar. So I wanna start off with an, with an overarching broad question and specifically related to Gaza, which is what this session is about. What is the significance of Gaza to the broader liberation struggle, this small strip of territory? Why is this so significant? And anybody can take the floor and we'll go from there. Leila, you can go ahead first. Okay. All right, so alaikum. Alaikum. thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for the wonderful introductions and thank you to AMP uh, for putting this uh, series on. I think it's so important to have constant reminders, I think for all of us, um, even for those of us who um, may already be you know, in the know, it's, you always learn something new, right? Um, so it's an excellent question and it's usually one that I preface any talk that I'm giving on the matter with because um, you know, often, Every now and then I'll get some kind of uh, question from the audience, like, well, why the focus on, on Gaza or what's, what's the deal with Gaza? And, um, you know, I sometimes like to, to start by quoting the, the Mahmoud Darwish line um, in his, in his uh, poem, Silence for Gaza, Samt uh, al Gaza, that Gaza equals the history of an entire homeland, right? So, um, you know, elsewhere we've seen um, people say Gaza is sort of a metaphor. But, but in summary, you know, it's through Gaza that you can un understand the Palestinian experience at large and Israeli policies as they were intended vis-a-vis -vis Palestine and Palestinians. Gaza is kind of the microcosm of that, right, of everything happening um, uh, towards Palestinians, the history of Palestine can all be sort of summed up. Gaza is often considered the pilot project, right, um, where if Israel is attempting to uh, play out a certain policy or, or try out a, um, a, a set of weapons or whatever it is, they first do it in Gaza. Some say the precursor to the separation uh, barrier was the one that was first established around Gaza, for example. The idea of, um, of separation in general, the get ghettoization, right? Like as we see it played out in the West Bank was first played out in Gaza and then of course came into full force with a disengagement. Um, so, you know, I, I could go on and on, but I mean, it's, it's for all of these reasons, um, you know, and for those of you who aren't familiar with that poem, it's, it's really wonderful. I encourage you to read it, but for all of, all of those reasons, I think that, um, this is why I think Gaza is a very important sort of, you know, um, not to use the word case study, but a, a case study of understanding, uh, Palestine at large. And it's not necessarily that like. You know, it's just because Gaza, like, you know, and I'll talk about this later in terms of what are the kind of stereotypes um, that I personally like to resist. But I always talk about Gaza being uniquely both victim and aggressor. So it's not like we should just, you know, learn, understand about Gaza because like, oh, poor Gaza or whatever. No, there's there's actually much more to it um, than that. And, and all the reasons I mentioned in terms of the intricacies of Israeli um, policies and settler colonialism as they're practiced. If you really study Gaza carefully, then you begin to understand how they play out uh, in the rest of Palestine. And I'll talk a little bit more later about, about the specific policies, um, uh, the whole policy goals and policy aims vis-a-vis Gaza. But I want to give a chance for the other speakers to, to answer as well. Thank you for that, Leila. Um, Dr. Um, Hatem Bazian, go ahead. I think uh, in terms of what is unique uh, with Gaza, but also at the same time, the uniqueness not to be uh, 
disconnected or thought of as a separate part of Palestine. Uh, I do think that we need to be uh, very uh, careful and cognizant that part of settler colonialism often, if not the normative, is to divide and conquer or divide and rule. Uh, so Gaza's exceptionalism in relations to the current period, it is that it is connected to the long history of Palestine uh, in general. Uh, in particular, if we think about that, the majority of the Gaza population uh, is a refugees, are, are refugees from the areas in 1948, uh, the areas that uh, Israel engaged in the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians and thus throwing the Palestinians into uh, Gaza and as such creating the conditions that are there, which is a concentration of refugees, that they could still see their homes and lands and properties right across the horizons from the, where, where they are. The second is that Gaza was always connected to the broader strategies of constantly attempting to, e to erase the Palestinians, to erase the Palestinians politically, to erase the Palestinians in relations to their specific calls for right of return, uh, specific uh, attempt to erase their ability to resist. And in this sense, it's also connected to the broader uh, entanglements with the greater or the larger arena of the Arab and Muslim world. So it's not surprising that as we speak of not only the 2008, but the 2012 and 2014 Israeli constant attacks you know, on Gaza, that it was constantly connected to the inner working of the Arab world uh, attempting to strike its own deals on the back of the Palestinians, as well as interfering in the dynamics that are Palestinian di political dynamics to make sure that Palestinians don't actually have the sense or the ability to have self-determination to decide on their own political aspirations and political horizons. To remind you that uh, immediately after the 1948 or right at the, at the cusp of the 1948 war, there were actually a meeting in September 1948 in Gaza to call for the independence of Palestine. So the significance of Gaza is not only that it is the location of resistance and steadfastness of today, but it's also it was the, some, the symbolic gathering of Palestinians in 48 to actually declare independence at the time. And then we see the political machinations that occurred between the Zionist movement or the new Israel state, the Arab world, whether it's Jordan, Egypt, and other states to actually make sure that a Palestinian uh, independent state does not emerge into existence. And that has been one main uh, feature of the continued attempt to erase the Palestinians and remove their ability to have their uh, sense of self-determination, their sovereignty on their own land, and to continue to actually uh, resist uh, settler colonialism as it unfolds in their, own, on, on, in their own lands. And therefore, Gaza is symbolic of the experiences of Palestinians in the West Bank, in uh, Palestine, historical Palestine, as well as you could actually compare it to what is took place for Palestinians in uh, Jordan, in Lebanon, and also the experiences of Palestinians right now in the civil war in Syria. Or you could also speak about the Iraq, uh, Kuwait war where Palestinians ended up actually being likewise subjugated to the political machinations of the Arab world in general. So that's how I look at Gaza in the current period. Thank you, Hatem, for that, uh, for emphasizing that symbolic sig significance. I uh, appreciate that. Um, Dr. Ramzi Barud, please. Thank you very much to AMP for hosting this important event. And I particularly appreciate the, the title of this event, uh, Gaza, the Soul of Palestine. And that kind of, in a way, kind of brings uh, the beautiful things that Leila and uh, um, Dr. Hatim kind of discussed, where there is an element of uniqueness in Gaza, but it's also kind of part and parcel of the larger uniqueness that is Palestine and the Palestinian people. Uh, you know, after every Israeli war or bombardment of Gaza, there's always this kind of familiar event that uh, transpires, and that is of people go leaving their homes and trying to reclaim a moment of normalcy 
um, sometimes they go to the mosques um, and the mosques are destroyed, as happened in my refugee camp, the Nusayrat refugee camp in Gaza, where I was born and raised. And, and yet somehow someone still stands on top of the ruins of the mosque and, and makes the call for prayer. And then the people would gather in whatever area that, you know, are near the mosque and they would still perform their prayers. And people would return to, um, again, to reclaim their lives and their humanity as much as possible. In the last war in particular, we have seen incredible deal of solidarity between Muslims and Christians in Gaza, where some churches opened their doors for Muslims to go and perform their prayers because many of the mosques were destroyed as well as schools and, and thousands of homes and so forth. I think the real secret about Gaza, and I really hate to appear like I'm romanticizing or following any kind of cliches here, but truly the people of Gaza. There is something very unique about the people of Gaza. Now, really, it, it's going to take up many more webinars to actually even just talk about the pre-Israeli history of Gaza, this incredible place that's been around. The known history of Gaza goes back to 4,000 years. Gaza had the Gaza shekels, the Gaza currency, before numerous countries that exist today, or civilizations even, existed. So there's something that, that has to be delinked about Gaza from Israel. We don't exist as Palestinians because Israel wished for us to be the enemy. We do not exist the moment that Israel decided for, for us to be ethnically cleansed and for our villages to be destroyed. We have existed for thousands of years before the existence of Israel, and we will continue to exist thousands of years after Zionism is defeated. I There's absolutely no doubt in my mind about this, not because, you know, Palestinians are tenacious and, and stubborn and, and, and all of that, no, but because history tells us so. And really, if you look at Gaza, you would kind of see that history all playing out. If you look at the modern history of Gaza, say the history of Gaza in the post-Nakba, the, the post-Israeli, the catastrophic Israeli destruction of the Palestinian homeland in 1948, when nearly 500 Palestinian towns, villages, and localities were destroyed, and nearly a million Palestinians were ethnically cleansed, you will kind of see that Gaza kind of has taken this different trajectory, where we look at two different histories that somehow um, uh, they are parallel, some some, somehow overlap, but they are absolutely linked to one another. One is the history of Israeli brutality, and the other the history of Palestinian resistance. But let me qualify the word resistance here. When I talk about resistance, I'm not talking about uh, rockets, and I'm not talking about bullets and guns. I'm talking about the people themselves, the spirit of the resistance, the idea that under no circumstance will Palestinians give up. No matter what the geopolitical uh, you know, look and feel of the Middle East is, no matter what kind of balances of power at play, no matter what position Washington takes or doesn't take, resistance in the minds of Gazans and of all Palestinians, in fact, is an idea that itself cannot be defeated. And if you look at the history of Gaza from the very, very beginning, starting in 1948, before Hamas, before Fatah, before any of the current political paradigm even existed, um, peasants, villagers, people who were kicked out of their homes and they became refugees, organized, and they fought back. They called them the Fideiyin, uh, the people who sacrificed their lives for the, 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 you know, the collective good of the people. And it's really been kind of that story, that trajectory of resistance that never ceases, and, and, and I don't think it will ever, ever cease until Palestine is free. But you will also find the exact same opposite happening on the Israeli side, the, the history of brutality. You know, there was a, you know, we quite often talk about the current wars and all of that, but rarely do we mention what actually happened before Hamas won the elections in 2006, and that uh, you know resulted in Israeli sanctions and the you know the, the split between Hamas and Fatah and all of this. No, no, no. History didn't start there. History began much earlier. The first, one of the major massacres that Israel carried out in Gaza was in 1956, when Israel uh, captured the Gaza Strip for a short period of time before they vacated Gaza and they returned in 1967 to carry out their permanent occupation. They went to the, the, uh, the refugee camp of Khan Yunis in the Gaza Strip. They took children, mothers, fathers, they lined them up against their homes, and they shot over 270 
five of them, 275 that we can actually document with names. Rafah, a nearby refugee camp, 111 Palestinians were massacred in cold blood and so forth. And every time Israel carries this kind of massacre, every time Palestinians retaliate by organizing themselves, by mobilizing, by revolting, by resisting in numerous other means. And we see this happening until today. Now, it doesn't mean that there are no new meanings that we can glean out of this scenario. Israel always claims that, that it doesn't really care about Gaza from a, a geostrategic point of view, that Gaza is not important territorially for Israel. In fact, it was Shimon Peres, the late Israeli prime minister who has been designated as a dove by Western uh, political discourse for some reason. You know, he's the one who once said, I wish that Gaza would, that, that the sea would open up and would swallow Gaza. Um, so Israel has always given that impression that Gaza is not important, but if that is the case, then why this special siege on Gaza? Why the constant wars on Gaza, 2007 and 8, and this is the, um, an, an, the anniversary of, of, of this war, um, over 1,400 Palestinians were killed in Gaza. 2012, hundreds of Palestinians. 2014, uh, over 2,300 Palestinians were killed. Tens of thousands were injured. Thousands are still maimed and, and handicapped as a result of this. Why is Gaza not significant if indeed, or how does Israel claim that Gaza is not significant if indeed Israel is willing to spend massive amounts of, of, of money, resources, uh, its reputation as far as public relations is concerned, just to contain Gaza? And that really is the key term, in my opinion, contain Gaza, contain the idea of Gaza, the resistance of Gaza, using Gaza as this uh, field of experiment for collective punishment, uh, a message to be sent to the rest of Palestinians. If you misbehave, then you will have the same fate of Gaza. In actuality, the West Bank in Gaza, all Palestinians in historic Palestine are experiencing a different level of siege and war, racism, discrimination, and so forth and so on. But Gaza is the microcosm that channels all the terrible and brutal energies and policies of Israel and the Israeli government. You know, just one last thing I want to finish with here. A former, uh, a former Israeli official and a, a good friend with the late Ariel Sharon, known in Gaza and the rest of Palestine as the bulldozer because of the number of homes he destroyed in Gaza in the 1970s, once said something to the effect of, we, you know, we don't want Palestinians in Gaza to die. We just want to put them on a diet. Uh, that, that term was used in 2006. Later on, they discovered that indeed God, the Israel has been counting calories. There was a report published in various Israeli media uh, in which they spoke that the Israeli government actually counts the calories that are consumed by every Palestinian in Gaza to ensure that they are malnourished, but they do not die. I'm not even here talking about the kind of experimentations that they do in terms of weapons, white phosphorus and, 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 and all sorts of Israel's so-called security apparatus. I'm talking about the social experiment itself of trying to starve people and to ensure that they do not die. This is Gaza for Israel, but Gaza for us Palestinians is something else entirely. It is resistance, it's perpetual hope, and it's defiance. And as long as Gaza is fighting, as long as we haven't lost yet. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Ramzi Baroud. I actually have the exact quote, um, Dove Weisglass, an Israeli, a former Israeli official. The idea is to put the Palestinians on a diet, but not to make them die of hunger. That's the uh, direct quote. I think that you're referring to the same statement there. Um, um, there, something that was emphasized here was the settler colonial nature of, of, of Israel. So if you can expound on the, la uh, on the, on the last point that you made, Dr. Baroud, on the fact that, you know, there is this claim that Gaza is not biblically significant, that, um, so, so on that basis, how does Gaza fit into Israel's settler colonial designs? Because to maintain a demographic majority and also to capture as much land as possible, Obviously, it, it, it does not want a small strip of territory that's biblically insignificant that has two million Palestinians in it. That will that will you know that will bring that demographic balance down. So, how does it fit within that overarching settler colonial design? You're on. You're on. Go ahead. 
Gaza was quite important. I, th I think this idea that Gaza in is insignificant uh, for Israel's geopolitical and colonial designs, I actually think it's brand new. If we look back at history, and I've tried to chart as much of it as possible, especially in my book, uh, Gaza, the, the Untold Story, My Father Was a Freedom Fighter. Um, if you look at Israeli policies immediately after 1967, the, in fact, the, 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 the intention of building settlements in Gaza um, happened slightly earlier than the intentions of building uh, illegal Israeli Jewish settlements in the West Bank. Ariel Sharon in particular was entrusted with that mission. There was massive movements of ethnic cleansing that happened. The poor Bedouins, the nomadic Palestinians of Gaza and, and, and Deir Saba were particularly kind of victimized in that early process. Thousands of people, numerous tribes were dislocated entirely. Then they moved to the Shati refugee camp and other refugee camps in northern Gaza, where in Shati alone, over 2,000 Palestinian homes were demolished and thousands of people were ethnically cleansed. This is, by the way, why R.L. Sharon has acquired the, the, the title, the bulldozer, because of the military bulldozers that moved into Gaza and immediately uh, wiped out entire neighborhoods and, and, and large swathes of, of built land in the Gaza Strip. And of course, they immediately start building the agriculture settlements and they were relying on these settlements in many ways. And they wanted to turn Gaza in what they called the Mount Carlo of the Middle East, meaning that they are going to subdue the population and it's going to be a place of cheap tourism and, and so forth and so on. But the reason that this kind of thinking became marginal over the years is not just because the, the population of Gaza exploded, but also because they knew that there can never be stability in Gaza. There can never be a normalization of the situation in Gaza. There has never been a period in the history of Gaza in which resistance was not taking one shape and form or another. And way before Hamas and the Islamic Jihad, which is now kind of, you know, uh, Gaza is being accused of being a hub for Islamic terrorism and all this nonsense. In actuality, it was the socialists in particular, not even Fatah. It was the socialist movements, the Communist Party, the Popular Front, the Socialist Front, that were actually leading the armed resistance in the Gaza Strip. So it doesn't matter what ideology, what uh, what schools of thoughts, what, what period in history, Gaza has always fought back. And because of that, with time, Gaza became a burden, a financial burden for Israel, a military burden. They could not guarantee outcomes anymore. So with time, it became kind of removed from the Zionist colonial calculations in Palestine, which led to the 2005 so-called disengagement from Gaza. That was declared by Ariel Sharon when he ended up moving the Israeli illegal Jewish settlers in Gaza to other parts of the West Bank and so forth, and, 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 and in, in, you know, replacing active military occupation with the, with the current state of perpetual siege. So for a long time, Gaza was part of the colonial calculation, but they failed. So they are trying to contain it, but without actually paying the price for their occupation anymore. Just wanted to, uh, you know, discuss or expand on this idea of the biblical text uh, used as a map for settler colonialism. Uh, in this sense, the text, as we know, is open to interpretation, a very wide interpretation, as well as what we call speculative theological interpretation. So we need to be very uh, cognizant of how uh, connected uh, settler colonialism to the use of religious texts to justify uh, its territorial claims, its control dominations. A good example would be, uh, the United States is definitely is not considered to be the Holy Land, but the biblical text was used as a way to actually uh, engage in settler colonialism. And interestingly enough, uh, those who engage in settler colonialism in the Americas referred to the indigenous uh, populations as the Canaanites. So in here, the biblical text was transformed into an imaginary that gave the credence for uh, the settlers who came to the new world 
to settle and use religion because in essence you can't actually ask God whether he actually authorized somebody to take your home. In essence, you become the reference point and everything becomes acceptable. I say this because we often tend to try to locate the logic of settler colonialism by trying to navigate whether it's in the Bible or not. Even if it was not in the Bible, Settler colonialism will interpret whatever is there in order to rationalize its in existence. And as we understand, if you trace the, the emergence of uh, Zionism itself, it came in partnership with the British colonial project. And in the entry of the British and the Zionist colonial project, it was strategic positioning to protect British colonial possession in Egypt, as well as the trade route to India, that was at the hub of British thinking and the partnership or bringing the junior partner of Zionists with them in order to bring about this, uh, the uh, depopulating of Palestine and the unfolding of settler colonialism, which requires one is committing genocide of the indigenous population or transfer. And in both cases, these were two things that were committed to the Palestinians. So we need to know exactly the logic by which Zionism engaged in and how religious text gets to be mobilized. And you could see this religious text is mobilized with the Christian Zionists in the United States. And increasingly, and this is something I'm increasingly talking about, is Muslim Zionists, which you see those who are coming from the Muslim world, whether it's the United Arab Emirates, the Morocco, uh, Egypt, Jordan, Sudan, and now we're talking about Indonesia, all coming in with the notion uh, that uh, uh, Islam and reading Islamic text uh, in order to rationalize and justify the embracing of Zionism because many of these regimes or these states are post-colonial states that are still wedded and emerge of colonialism. So religious text right now is being utilized as an instrument of settler colonialism in Palestine and we need to know the long history of this uh, settler colonialism and what we call manifest destiny in essence. So Palestinians are experiencing Zionist manipulation and use of religious texts for manifest destiny. And so this is the context for us to understand that. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Bazian, for providing that uh, very interesting context. I want to talk about Gaza as it stands right now. Um, the UN reports say that by 2020, we are eight days away from the end of 2020, because that will be un un uninhabitable, unlivable. What, how, do, how does Gaza look now compared to 10 years ago, 15 years ago, after so many massacres and Israel implementing its policy of mowing the lawn every, every, every few years, just you know, destroying infrastructure, destroying the economy, the healthcare system, destroying lives, um, Dispossessing people now. There's a, there's there's three levels of dispossession within within Gaza over over the over the past few uh, massacres. So how does the future look for Gaza on a humanitarian level? And what what I mean, this is a question that I don't even know if it's answerable. What can be done to kind of reverse that process just in the just in the immediate and then of course long term? Anybody can tackle that. Uh, yeah, I I can I can start with that. Uh, I mean, there's so, first of all, I want to say so much great information here and material. I'm listening, you know, enthusiastically. And I just, I love what everyone said about positioning Gaza also, obviously, as, as part of Palestine, right? That's something we shouldn't forget. Um, I know um, um, Hatim said that in the beginning, that we shouldn't forget it's part and parcel of, of Palestine. And of course, recently, and I'll talk about this later, one of the, you know, um, stated goals, um, Israeli goals vis a vis Gaza is to actually isolate it from the West Bank, separate it from the West Bank and reduce um, um, access um, and movement, right? And so, and you see that happening sort of psychologically as well. Um, uh, and um, and also the point, just, you know, reiterating the point about the geostrategic, historically the geostrategic position of Gaza has always been, there's always been one of like those who wish to conquer, you know, or, or access the greater Levant had to first access Gaza and kind of it being sort of the locus of of resistance in general, and you know the the importance of, and I and I also absolutely agree about everything that was said, you know, biblically and so forth. But being able to conquer that, the idea, right, is so 
much more powerful for a conquering army um, than conquering land itself. And of course, the, the strategic decision um, of the disengagement, the strategic, you know, um, decision to disengage and relocate um, the settlers and re um, shape the form th that the occupation took, right, is something we'll, we can talk about later. But all of that is very important because we shouldn't sort of fall prey to the that whole um, myth of, and I know that's one of the topics we're going to discuss, the myths of like the fact that the occupation ended. But in terms of how Gaza looks today versus 10 years ago, that's something I've actually been writing a lot about because I had a, you know, ch several chances to go back over the few years. So I've kind of been able to see the progression of, you know, um, how it looked like when I was when I was working there and covering the disengagement between 2003 to 2007 and the election and then going back in 2010 and then again in 2013 and then most recently I was there exactly one year ago and I can tell you the you know the difference is it was stark I mean I, I myself and it's not something that you really I always say you have to sort of look at the nuances and read between the lines kind of thing or I say you have to um, look inside the soup because that's when you know, because one can easily be um, fooled if you just go to the main city streets, and I'm sure Ramzi can agree, and then you just see the new cafes popping up or building, and you go, oh, things look great, and, you know, the, the, the rubble has been cleared and whatnot. Um, but then you begin to visit people's homes, and you eat with them, and you and you sit, and you realize that that 8 um, to 90% of the population is no longer able to consume a protein-based meal more than once a month. So just like let that settle in for a second, you know, and I'm not suggesting that's necessarily something we should all be eating like protein every day, but just as a marker, socioeconomic marker, um, people are eating only two meals a day, mainly, you know, potatoes, fried potatoes or flat or hummus, right? Or else something like, you know, um, uh, room based dishes like basada and whatnot, right? That's what they're eating every single day. And then maybe they can scrape together a little bit. And I'm just giving you these details to help them understand how things have changed. Um, maybe they can scrape together enough to be able to um, create uh, uh, a meal, cook a meal with a with a protein once a month. And as for you know fish, this is of course being directly um, access was something people could do with great difficulty. And mainly it was it was locally farmed fish, not fish from the sea. Now it's become all all bit of an impossibility. Almost everyone I spoke to said maybe once every six months if we're lucky. And when we're talking about fish, we're talking about imported Thai fish. We're not talking about anything that's caught locally, right? And so you really do begin to see the Im And this is just, of course, in terms of what people are consuming, um, but also the impact, the long-term um, impact of, um, of um, dependence on food aid, handouts, and rations, and things like, you know, depleted nutrients like white rices and sugars and flours and things like this. And more and more um, people becoming lacking access and distant from the um, you know the grains and the and the food um, um, foods that they are accustomed to, as well as the food ways, right? By by way of farmers, and that's a whole other topic. Being able to access their farmlands and fishing, being able to access the fishing waters. Um, but you know, and I, I don't usually like to dwell too much on statistics because they can only tell you so much, which is why I was trying to kind of give it a little bit more color and personal flavor. But um, but definitely for me at least the, the difference was was salient. I mean I I didn't see it as much maybe five or six years ago, but when I went a year ago, I can definitely tell you it was hard. Now this doesn't speak of course to to and we'll talk about this later to the general spirit or whatever. But you know it's no secret that you know what is the horizon? Obviously we're talking about a an incredibly you know a resilient um, you know, intelligent. Um, you know, um, population that can do a lot with very little, that can innovate, very innovative population. And I myself are constantly, you know, for people building 3D printers from scratch and creating filaments and, you know, um, things like this, tourney kits. And, you know, I mean, it's just, it, it never ends, right? Um, and so that's kind of, and we'll talk later about the, the positive all that. But in terms of the difference, in terms of, you know, just, you know, obviously you have the unemployment, you have the, I mean, what, what they term in the humanitarian world as um, food insecurity. I like to talk more about the food um, sovereignty angle rather than the you know, food insecurity, but the idea being that people lack access um, to nutritious food, meaning not that it's not available, that they're unable, there's no purchasing power. They're unable to actually physically purchase.
just fresh fruits and vegetables, um, uh, you know, uh, chicken, meat, fish, etc. They're just really, you know, being sustained on rations and on um, and on. And that's not to say that you're dealing with. I, and I, this was something that a UN, uh, the chief of the UN office once told me that I found very profound. He said, "Look, nobody." And this was years ago. We're not even talking today. But he said, "Nobody is starving in Gaza, but everybody is hungry." Right, so just let that sink in. Meaning, this idea, this very deliberate policy that Ramzi referred to, which was, it was not one that intended to, you know, have the population all collapse. In fact, what the stated policies were um, no prosperity. This, these were called the tenants, the tenants of the um, this engagement. No prosperity, no development, no humanitarian crisis. So the idea was that we, we as an, you know, an Israeli entity, an Israeli army, Israeli government, will target, deliberately target through these various you know, um, uh, assaults and attacks and, and siege the productive sectors of society, you know, agriculture, um, universities, uh, the fishing sector, on and on, right? And ensure that they cannot prosper by continuing to ban so-called um, um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting the, the phrase double. Um, you know, what I'm referring to the double double use items or whatever they're called. Um, um, it's the the term is slipping. Meaning in their in their thinking, items that can potentially in the Israeli mind, uh, Israeli government scheming can be used for you know um, sort of sinister purposes. Like we're not going to allow in planks more than two centimeters. But this is a thing, by the way, lest they use them for, you know, putting uh, reinforcing tunnels with, or we're not going to allow with this still continues, components to, for factories, sewage treatment plants, peanut factories, whatever. Um, and so this continues to be a problem, which basically is in line with that tenant, which prevents, um, you know, entities, factories, you know, companies, people from prospering. And then no humanitarian crisis, what does that mean? Is that you always want to keep things, you know, on the edge of collapse, but never quite you know, it, um, going, tipping over into complete humanitarian crisis so that it doesn't create this huge media outcry. And thus the whole thing of we want to ensure that we're meeting the specific caloric count so nobody can say we're not allowing enough food trucks or whatever in. Um, and thus the analogy of Gaza being, you know, um, not even um, a, an open air prison because, you know, as, um, you know, there are really ones that prisoners are assured certain rights, but rather Gaza as a population, a captive population of caged animals, where the idea is how those on the outside view them um, and making sure that they just barely have enough to sustain themselves, but nothing more. So, you know, things are, are stark, but I don't say that to, you know, stark in terms of the actual, um, you know, on the ground impact of 10 plus years of siege, right? Um, and I, that's what I'm talking about. I don't like to be like doomsday scenarios or whatever, because there's still a lot of you know, despite all of this um, hope that we can derive and we can talk about later, but just, you know, in response to the question of where things stand um, 10 years on, I can, you know, definitely tell you that it is kind of at this sort of stagnant status quo of like people, you know, there's not much, you know, in terms of what, you know, but I can tell you that, you know, and it's the same old sort of cycle, right? We bring the food in, we have to make sure certain, you know, and the, the NGOs and the large, you know, humanitarian organizations are kind of trapped in this cycle of being captive to, you know, the Israeli policies that guide all of this and having being obligated to deliver the food aid that then Palestinians in Gaza are dependent on and are depleted of nutrients as a result. So there's massive widespread, you know, iron deficiency in India amongst children, for example. And you see very common, when I was there, it was even more shocking than 10 years ago, just how much stunted growth there is amongst children because of the, um, you know, the, the nutrient, the lack of access to nutrients and, and so forth. If, if I may uh, uh, jump in, in here for a minute, uh, uh, I think the, if we f focus on the problem in Gaza, I think what we needed to describe it accurately. The problem is not that Palestinians are hungry, which they are, that they don't have access to food, which is the fact. The key problem is the following, that Palestinians in Gaza and I would say the rest of Palestine are facing an Israeli, Arab, American, European, and UN structured violation of their fundamental rights, which results in all these elements being missing. 
So Israel controls one border, but Egypt controls the other. And on the other border, there is United Nation uh, uh, forces, United Nation teams. There is American military marine teams right there that they helped uh, seal the subterranean access of Gaza. And the United Nation is sitting there. It's supposedly the custodian of the international uh, law and the international system is acting impotent in front of a small state that is structurally violating the rights of the Palestinians. That is the reality that the Palestinians... So in essence, Gaza is symbolic to the failure of the international system to be accountable to international law, human rights, and so on. So while, as many of us Palestinians, we got accustomed to getting all these delegations that give us some of the beautiful lectures about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We might be the only people that know all the articles of the Charter of the United Nations. We know all the articles of the Geneva Convention. We go possibly on vacation and take in those, those readings with us. But the rest of the world basically comes in as part of their, what you call, tour of duty to give us the lecture about international law and then go out to business as usual, like Macron's these days who's speaking about what you call French values while selling weapons to Sisi and the rest of the Arab world and telling us how to act and conduct ourselves. So I think this is the reality that we face relative to Gaza and the Palestinian uh, political uh, condition that we are. Our condition is a political question. And that political question is that we are facing an international system that structurally accepted our dispossession and continue to actually pay our oppressor, the Israeli, and also facilitate other Arab governments to participate in our structured dispossession. If we don't understand this, then again, we continue to be what you call lectured upon in international law, human rights. And we are in essence being a Palestinian, in essence, you could say we give so many people employment in the humanitarian human rights sector for them to continue to actually uh, not deal with the fundamental questions that we have to deal with, which is the structured dispossession of the Palestinians. That is absolutely correct. Um, to put it put it in full context here, um, um, Ramzi, did you want to uh, respond to that? When, when um, yes, or when, add to it? Uh, of course, I, I fully agree. Um, yeah, we we must talk about the humanitarian crisis. But we can't talk about it as if Palestinians are a charity case. There is uh, there is much more to it than this. Uh, Palestinians in Gaza and outside of Gaza, uh, men and women are some of the most educated of all Arabs and all people in that region. Uh, with uh, uh, the uh, literacy rate is is uh, one of the highest in, in, in you know in, in the whole world and. Palestinian universities compete, despite of the occupation and apartheid and all this, with many other universities uh, all across the Middle East region. So as far as, you know, the, the, the human capital of Palestine, despite of everything, is still one of the healthiest and strongest uh, of all populations throughout the Middle East. The problem, therefore, is indeed a political uh, issue, and it has to be dealt with um, as such. Uh, unemployment in Gaza right now is absolutely skyrocketing. Just before the uh, the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic kicked in, uh, nearly half of all Palestinians in Gaza were unemployed. Now one can imagine that the situation is far worse uh, and the unemployment uh, has is, is now not being rectified in any way, of course, especially that UNRWA, the UN agency responsible for the welfare of Palestinian refugees, is going bankrupt thanks to the American war on UNRWA. So even the charity, even the humanitarian work that is being done by UNRWA and others are being blocked. So um, as, as, as if really the, the idea here is let's go even beyond the, the traditional starvation of Gazans into a whole new territory. Uh, but when Dr. Hatem was talking about lecturing, uh, it, it, there is this thing that kind of kicked in, you know, immediately. I just Googled it when he was still talking. 
uh, when President Obama went to Egypt in June 2009 to lecture the Arabs and Muslims and Palestinians specifically uh, about you know, democracy and reforms and such and, and, and so forth and so on. This happened uh, only a few months after the Gaza war in 2008-9 had concluded when Palestinians were still mourning their dead. And this is what uh, President Obama said, just one short sentence of, of the long lecture he has given Palestinians. He said, Palestinians must abandon violence. Resistance through violence and killing is wrong and it does not succeed. I just find it such, you know, such uh, um, and strange and, and, and baffling and, and mind-blowing statement that you go to a nation that is grieving, that burying 1,400 bodies, and by that time, dozens more have, have died who were wounded seriously and critically during the war to tell them, do not use violence. But when it comes to Israel, the most generous and the kindest of statements that the Americans would do uh, um, to ch chastise Israel is to urge Israel to use, not to use disproportionate violence. I mean, imagine this, a colonial, a brutal colonial apartheid regime that is experimenting with weapons, killing tens of thousands of innocent unarmed civilians is being told even by the United Nations itself, do not use disproportionate weapons or do not have a disproportionate response, as if the occupation itself is not one of the greatest acts of aggressions according to, the inter to international law and the United Nations itself. But those who are resisting, those who are fighting back, not because they are really about to take over Tel Aviv or Netanya, but fighting back for a shred of their dignity, they are being told, that you should not be utilizing violence. It does not su succeed. Bad Palestinians, good Israel. So this is, these are the lectures that uh, Dr. Hatem was referring to. And Palestinians are just sick and tired of it. Sick and tired of this mentality that no matter what happens to us, it is the onus is on us to prove our innocence. The onus is on us to prove that we are not terrorists, that we don't want to destroy Israel, that we are not anti-Semitic, that we are not this or this or this or that. It's always on us. As far as Israel is concerned, it's getting our weapons, $3.8 billion of American weapons going to Israel in every year, including just of yesterday, 500 million for missile defense that passed as part of the COVID-19 relief bill by the Congress. Why does Israel need to develop its missiles? Who's these missiles are being against to, whether in Gaza, West Bank, Lebanon, Syria, and elsewhere, against innocent civilians, as has always been the case. So yes, of course, thank you, Dr. Hatem. We are sick and tired of lectures. We want people to understand the reality from our point of view. And they we want real solidarity, real solidarity, not lectures, not for us to behave ourselves or to learn how to resist in a proper way like Gandhi or not Gandhi. We have been resisting for nearly a century and we will continue to resist. And the onus is on the occupation and the apartheid regime to end their brutality and to end their aggression in ways that are consistent with international law. No more, no less. What a powerful note that was. Um, uh, thank you, thank you for that. I, I, before we get into questions, there's one there's one element that I wanted to e emphasize here, and that is the um, the I mean there 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 are so many myths that we can go over, but one one myth that that does gain traction in um, in our in U.S. media discourse is that Gaza is no longer um, uh, occupied territory. Israel um, through its disengagement in 2005. They withdrew the settlers. They withdrew the army. Hamas is now in control. It's you know they should they should become the Singapore of the Mediterranean, so on and so forth. And and they're the ones launching rockets into Israel. It's its own territory. And in 2007, and this is what goes against that myth, Israel declared Gaza hostile territory and actually has a buffer zone inside Gaza. And it controls it by land, by air, by sea, controls the population registry, controls what comes in, what comes out, controls, the, as uh, Leila mentioned earlier, the nautical miles that fishermen can travel for their, for, their, for their sustenance. 
So how does this myth gain traction in our discourse when it is so obvious that is that Gaza is under a brutal military occupation, not just the normal military occupation? Well, uh, again, I, I think what we need is to put things first. Israel and the Zionist project is a European sponsored incubated project. So it is not a myth. It is actually part of a strategy. It is part of a whole partnership and embracing of Zionism. And this is, again, for us to be very clear as we speak about Palestine and Palestinians. We're trying to appeal to the Western audience. But in appealing to Western audience, we need to actually be very clear that Israel, in the way that it was constructed, would not have been possible without it being sponsored, incubated by Great Britain, which is no longer great, and also then taken on by the United States as part of its strategic engagement in the broader Arab and Muslim world, whether it's interest in trade routes, oil, or in maintaining post-colonial states that are open markets, neoliberal economics, and so on. So we're trying to prove that Gaza is still occupied. Well, I would say the whole Palestine is occupied, as well as what I call post-colonial states that are franchises that continue to send the best and brightest and their resources to the global north. So what we need is a sound analysis in order for understand to define the problem and then communicate to the Western audience, if that's our appeal, to understand for them that you're talking about your lifestyle, that you need to understand that is connected to the misery that is Gaza and the misery that is in, in, in many parts of the uh, global south. And that type of analysis requires considerable investment, both of our talent understanding, as well as the people that we speak to, at a time where you know that alter alternative facts are the reality that people actually are operating. So our, our really our uh, climb up the hill to alter both the situation in Gaza today and all of Palestine and other parts of the world is a really steep hill, but that's the hill that we need to climb. Otherwise, we'll continue to what you call to pedal water and think that we're actually making change. Yeah, along with that, I missed part of the question. Sorry, my reception was kind of spotty, but I think the question was how to counter the myths. Is that right? About Gaza's occupation not having ended? Is that correct? Yeah. Correct. Yeah, yeah. correct. And, and I correct. love everything that was just said. I love about how to, to you know, contextualize it. Um, and, you know, another approach um, is to also just look at the, obviously, the nitty gritty, um, you know, the, the, the legalese of it, right? Which is for those who, who really want to understand, you define what it means to actually, um, you know, be sovereign versus to continue to be occupied. And at the time, um, the, the NGO Gisha had wrote a really great report called, it was like a 100-page report at the time, called Disengaged Occupiers, um, in which they essentially laid out what they referred to as the markers of occupation, um, being uh, the taxation system, the population registry, the airspace, the borders, and the sea, uh, all ha having been, or con which continued to be under um, Israeli control, thereby concluding that Gaza was still effectively under occupation at the time when Ariel Sharon um, had tried to claim in the UN that the occupation had officially ended. None of those things, none of the, the control over none of those things, any of those things was relinquished, right? Continues to be. Um, and some of them, and I, it's some th things that I continue, and it sounds very technical, but they're very important to understand because specifically, for example, when you talk about population registry, this is one that doesn't make sense. To, don't, a lot of people don't understand unless you happen to have a hawiya or, or you know, a relative who does. Um, and then you begin to understand how that, you know, is part and parcel of the larger um, overriding Israeli matrix of control, the way that they control the movement and access um, over and, and between and to um, the land of Palestinians, right? Um, that very critically and crucially continues to be under Israeli control, even after um, the disengagement. You know, and a lot of the, the reason that it became so difficult was just because of the way that the media, that, that the message that was sent out there, we have officially ended the occupation, the occupations ended Gaza. Even, you know, um, a lot of, um, you know, supporters of the Palestinian cause would say things like, you know, when Israel left Gaza in 2005, right? Rather than, you know, we always just referred to it as disengaged, literally, from Gaza. 
um, dismantled the settlements and, you know, relocated them, you know, um, uh, restructured the occupation over Gaza. So it's just the way that you chose to describe it. And I remember at the time Diana Bhutto saying um, um, something like, um, you know, you can't be half pregnant, you know, you're either, <laughs> you either are or you aren't, right? So you can't be half occupying, you either are or you aren't. And that really applied to the case of Gaza, but they played it very strategically in the sense that they tried to, you know, um, put forth this this charade of, you know, we've ended the occupation, what more did they want? They continued to throw rockets at us, you know, we, you know, we, all, all we've done, we gave them everything they wanted. And this, you know, just goes to prove that we must continue to control them because they can't be trusted. And it just played into the larger kind of st overriding strategy, right? Um, which is exactly, exactly what they wanted. So it just helps to understand those technicalities, the population registry, the taxation, you know, Palestinians are taxed twice over, which I think a lot of people don't understand. Um, very critically, the borders. And this is something that wasn't a surprise. I mean, everybody who was, anybody at the time, analysts and economists were saying, without guaranteeing access and movement for Palestinians, this disengagement will essentially mean, mean nothing. Um, and of course, that's exactly what happened. Um, and by that, action, movement for both Palestinian people and for goods, in the sense of guaranteeing their ability to move freely in and out of, of Gaza to the rest of Palestine, to the world, which of course never happened, which of course Egypt colluded with Israel on, in addition to goods, right? So being able to freely import and export when and, and how they please, which also, of course, has never happened. Right, and you know, when people say um, they withdrew settlers and they dismantled the settlements, they transferred the settlers <laughs> and they expanded um, the settlements. Like something and there was like um, 20,000 20, settlers at the time were relocated to other settlements that were not as populated. Um, Correct. And there's a lot of great infographics at the time. This wasn't anything new, but it was just, you know, and, the, and of course the international media didn't help. It was, everybody was just buying the story, you know, um, wholesale of, you know, Israel having ended the occupation and Sharon as, a, you know, Bush referring to him as a man of peace and, and on and on. And I, th I think a spokesperson once said uh, he used the term for formaldehyde to explain what the purpose of the di disengagement was to kind of just that, freeze that the right. process. Was, and, um, you're right. Yeah, it was it was Dev Weiss, the same, the same, the same, um, the same, the same guy, right? Weiss the guy same, was the same responsible person. for the Gaza diet. Yeah, yeah. He, I don't know where he comes up, but he essentially had said the disengagement is a type of formaldehyde. The intention is not to end the occupation, but rather right. to indefinitely put the so-called peace process on hold, you know? Um, and so this is, again, if we, we don't really have to, you know, overthink it, you know, they, the people who developed the policy themselves were very clear about it. They, they were never, they never had any intention of like obfuscating and they were very clear. They just said, look, this is, we're not ending the occupation here. We just want to put this on hold as long as we can. It's just a, it's just a strategy. Gaza's a thorn in our side kind of thing. How can we more effectively, you know, continue the settler colonial project while uh, putting this resistance, this, you know, um, sort of point that is that is Gaza on hold and having it serve as a lesson to other Palestinians. And it's, it's so disappointing that we have gone past the hour here. I wanted to I it felt like it didn't it didn't it didn't feel like an hour. So but uh, before we conclude, I did want to get into these two questions that were that were put up. Um, one of them was uh, from Ladorna uh, Faf, and the question is, what about the, the new yeah, UN the special? Unfortunately, so I'm relying on you. Okay, so the question is, and this is for anybody that wants to tackle it, what about the new <laughs> UN special coordinator for the Middle East, Tor when is, when is, when is Land, who replaced um, Ladinov as the special East uh, Middle East coordinator? So what about that? Well, they got a new job and they will take a few tours. They'll get some extra frequent miles uh, on their travel record. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you notice, even when we have sound reports and investigation and so on, at the end of the day, the five permanent powers of the, of the Security Council uh, with the United States being able to suppress anything that actually will make a dent in the reality of what the Palestinian face. And let me conclude with the following. As it relates to Israel, from the European and the United States perspective, the success of Israel is a success of, quote, Western civilization and the Western project. And therefore, not only that they have through it, they erase 
the long history of anti-Semitism, the long history of oppression, the long history of the World War I, World War II, but on this, they also could point to us as the insist as the constant presence of the uncivilized that continue to intrude on the global world scale to prevent the emergence of uh, success of Western civilization as it's defined, which actually connect to colonialism, market economy, neoliberalism, and so on. So that's why if, if we think about the United Nations officers, yes, they'll come and do nice things. They'll take some good pictures. They will tell, tell us how great our food is and so on. But the end, everything that comes out has to be cleared by the five permanent powers, has to be cleared by the United States. So I don't expect much. Even with the Biden administration, yes, he's going to do some symbolic gestures, bringing back the PLO office, uh, refunding the UNRWA and so on. But at the fundamental question, there is no sovereignty for the Palestinians, no dignity, no freedom. And those are the fundamental questions that nations can rise on. And as such, we should not expect any changes of who the new employee at the United Nations, basically, because at least as Palestinians, and maybe Ramzi and Layla will know that, we possibly know every UN, what you call envoy, that came to us. And we're the only one that are cursed to know this because no one, no one else in the world actually know who's this new employees, but we are given the hope that a new and improved version of a UN staff member that basically were, were clear that they're not going to see anything significant other than to say it is sunny today and it's going to be cloudy tomorrow as it relates to fundamental issues for the Palestinians. So pretty much it's symbolic. It's not, you know, symbolic, symbolic yeah. acts. Uh, if I may just add something uh, rather quick, yes. if that's all right. Um, just want to say that, um, you know, this whole idea that we need to wait for a savior coming to us, whether whether that of Joe Biden, as we were already told that Barack Obama was a savior earlier on, or some new United Nations envoy or, or anybody. In actuality, we are our own saviors. I mean, we have been waiting for 70 years for that Western, you know, leader, politician, journalist, author, someone to tell the truth, someone to take our pain to the rest of the world. And then we start arguing that, you know, things are changing, things are moving forward, you know, uh, things are happening. Well, in reality, we have been in this constant state of arrested development. The fact is our savior is neither an Arab nor an American nor a UN envoy. Our savior is ourselves. Um, the Palestinians in Gaza, and that's what's so beautiful about Gaza. You know, one time uh, years ago, I heard Noam Chomsky being asked a question, what can ordinary Americans do about the war? You know, and he answered by saying, you know, it's very strange that I get asked this question quite often in the West. When I am in the Middle East, whether in the context of Palestine or India or whatever else, People don't ask the question, what can ordinary people do? They just do it. Um, and that's what they are doing in Gaza. That's what they are doing in Palestine. The acts of resistance happen on a daily basis, despite of the corruption of our leadership, despite of the factional disunity between the various groups that claim to represent our people. We are still resisting because the people on the ground are strong enough, smart enough, unified enough, if not politically, at least culturally, that they are continuing to resist and they will continue to resist. So the question is not what can we do from outside in order for them to send them another savior, but rather what can we do to stand in genuine and authentic and practical solidarity with them on the ground? We need to talk to them directly. We can't speak on their behalf and we cannot speak at them. We cannot tell them how to resist. We cannot tell them how to live their lives. We can only stand side by side with them and stand in solidarity with them. And if, the, if we do have a savior outside of Palestine, it is certainly not Sheikh this or Amir that. Our savior is the real true solidarity with oppressed people and nations all over the world, from African American, uh, from the African American people to the Native Americans, to the South Africans, to all the nations in the world that have experienced colonialism and endured throughout the years and know fully and grasp the nature of our experience and know fully what we are going through. It is unity and hard work and dedication 
with these groups it, through a new medium that is based on true intersectionality. If it's going to be that, if, if, if they're going to ever be a savior, it is that savior, true solidarity. Um, and, and just really one last thing I just want to say, just a salute to the Palestinian people everywhere and to the, the fighting Gazans. And when I say fighting, really just existing is resisting. Every day their acts of resistance speak for themselves. They humble us, they truly do. And we thank them so much for doing so because without that, we will have absolutely no hope left. Those were uh, beautiful remarks. If there are any additional remarks, please make them equally as beautiful. Are you suggesting if they're not, we should just <laughs> stay silent? We should. We, I want to. I want to. I want to end on a high note. That's, That's why. No, I think beautiful. I mean, you're right. You're right. He leaves us. He leaves, he leaves us all speechless. I mean, that was so well said, Andy. Um, I so agree. Well, in fact, I always, you know, one thing I always say whenever people talk. About about, you know, well, why do the, you know, aren't the Egyptians your brothers, or why did the Arabs do that, or why, you know, um, it's exactly what you said, is for, for far too long, I think, you know, especially in the 90s and so forth, um, Palestinians were relying, we as Palestinians, on others to tell our stories for us, right? right. Um, a legitimizing white or Western voice, and that kind of reminds me of what you were saying, and, and I think then you began to see a shift in the 2000s and so forth, the Palestinians beginning to own and narrate their own experiences and stories. And that's where I see um, the power, you know, in terms of shifting and changing that narrative, at least for Palestinians who are able to do so. You know, I always say everyone plays a different role, wherever we may be, on the inside and the outside. Um, we should not discount that role. We have different you know, abilities granted to us. Um, we're in different positions of power and so on and so forth. But certainly narrating our own experiences, not relying on others to do that for us, not relying on any kind of savior, be they, you know, be it an Arab nation or state, like you were saying, or or any kind of envoy or anything like that. Um, I, I did want to ask myself a question, um, which was, where do both of you see, um, see, where do we go from here? Or where do you see, what does the future hold, given all that has unfolded uh, over the past, you know, year or so? Well... Uh, from my point of view, I'm very still very optimistic. Uh, I do think that whatever uh, power politics have been played, it's actually played uh, all its cards on the table. The normalization that has been witnessed, I would say, brought everything that's been in the back uh, rooms into the front rooms. Uh, so there is nothing fundamentally changed on those relations that have been in place, in essence, they were often fooling us, expressing solidarity while, in essence, continuing to coordinate, strategize, and uh, put their strategic interests with Israel. This is whether it's Morocco, Egypt, Jordan, Indonesia, United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Bahrain, and so on. So you speak about it in this sense. So I'm still optimistic because at the end of the day, it actually, it will expose this notion that you could try to maintain a settler colonial project without addressing the colonized population. And in essence, now is the colonized population, which is the Palestinians, not victims, even though we've been, we've been victimized, we're still asserting our rights to freedom, dignity, sovereignty of our own land. And you could have an hug United Arab, Arab Emirates, you could hug MBS, you could hug King of Morocco, you could hug as many as you want. We could actually line them up, all the 55 majority. You could hug them from day in and day out. It's still, at the end of the day, you're going to deal with the Khalili, with the Akawi, with the Ghazawi, with the Nabilsi, with the uh, uh, Rihawi, with everyone who's telling you this is this land is Palestine. It's been Palestine. It will continue to be Palestine. And no matter what erasure you could do, whether you use the biblical text, because part of the biblical text is also writes Palestine as secondary or being supporter, supporting actor in its own narrative. So we always have to insist that we are the center character in our own history. And what we often actually, this is again a part of, I would critique also Muslims as it, they relate to history because immediately Muslims say, well, 1000 BC, 
excuse me, history of Palestine is about 35,000 to 60,000 years in terms of archaeological discovery. So when you begin at 1000 BC, you accept the biblical narrative of settler colonialism that tried Palestinian history from its own particular narrative rather than actually also thinking of the long history Right, you have in the middle of Palestine one of the oldest olive trees in the world, six thousand years old olive tree. Right, when you begin in such narrative, you begin to forget. So, I'm very hopeful because we have faced not only Israel's occupation and colonization, but we face the Arab world duplicity. We face the European duplicity. We face the United States continued partnership. And you still, you go all over the world today, in every country, you'll see the Palestinian flag, you'll see the Palestinian resistance, you see the PDS, in every university, you see a Palestinian resistance, you see a Palestinian uh, engagement. And if there is anything that tells you that the erasure of Palestine have failed, and all what we are facing right now is just a strategy of demonization. And for me, that is not a success. That's actually a complete failure of the Zionist project to be able to eliminate a small group of people that with all other considerations should be erased out of the history, but shows the strength and the veracity of Palestinians, their steadfastness. And I think this is the message that we need to get to people that don't lose hope Get up, get to work. The person you're waiting for as a hero is you. Get up and do the work. Silence is not going to change history. So don't actually accept this adab and courtesy that, you know, you need to be careful. No, speak truth to power, right? We will be actually very courteous in speaking truth to power in every dynamic. Embrace the BDS. Organize the BDS. If they don't like it, we could recommend some therapists for them, including some who would actually give them a discount for this. And this is what we need to do. And I think we have a message to the world and the world have embraced our message in a broader, broader coalition. And I think that's where the success of the Palestinians at at this point. That was definitely equally powerful. So we are going to end on that high note. Thank you to our esteemed panel, Dr. Ramzi Baru, Dr. Hatem Bazian, and Leila Al-Haddad. Thank you so much for being part of this sixth educational webinar. And... Um, Free Palestine. Thank you. Free Palestine. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.